Hi and welcome. This is Derek Feldman with Achieve. We're glad you're with us today as we're going to be talking about email compelling or compelling email solicitations. Uh, unfortunately, Justin Brady, who is actually going to do this uh, webinar today, can't join us. Um, but I will be with you for the next hour as we talk through some of uh, some of the interesting things that's happening with email, and to also give you some insights as to how you can actually create some emails that will hopefully spark some solicitation uh, in donations. Of course. Um, this webinar is recorded, so if you do miss anything, no worries. We'll make sure and get you the recording. In addition to that, you can have the presentation uh, later on. Just let us know if you'd like that. And we'll also upload it into the uh, Achieve Access area. And then lastly, for any of you needing credits, CFRE or others, just let us know and we can validate those for you too at this time. So uh, how we'll do and organize today is that what we're going to do is actually go through a couple key things uh, over the course of this presentation. The first one being is talking through what's really happening with email and what we're seeing. Then we'll actually get through some case studies. You'll be able to see some actual examples. I can tell you the real responses. And then lastly, we'll end with a really a good checklist for you to go about in creating email content from solicitations, stuff that we use here uh, in addition to how we instruct our clients uh, to as well. So first and foremost, let's talk about really what's happening when it comes to the email standpoint. Um, it's interesting because as we look at the popularity of online giving and all the other kinds of things that even come about with email solicitations, social media solicitations, those kinds of things, we, we often hear about, wow, you can raise a ton of money. And, you know, there are some organizations that are really, really successful. They tend to also have very large, large email databases. Um, and so when you hear about those, you know, whether it be in a publication or whether in a blog or something else, we tend to find that a lot of those organizations have actually had a substantial amount of marketing assistance and or ability to, when they send out emails, um, that they have a larger list actually of, of email, an email population internally that's very large for them to sort of tap into. For a lot of small and medium-sized organizations, that's really tough. Um, and because not only do you not have a built-in maybe audience or constituency, maybe like a, you're not like a university who you know, graduates X amount every year where you can tap into, but from this standpoint, you've always got to build your email base. And so you're in this constant building mode of how do I sort of take our email list and grow it, and grow it twofold over the course of a year? And that seems like a very unrealistic number, but in fact, as you're going to see in some of the data points here in a little bit, that email has a very high churn rate. And what that means is that those that are departing and, you know, not only, not only, um, removing themselves from your list, but natural attrition that occurs from emails, uh, in themselves. And what the other thing that we're finding too is that in email, it is very easy to acquire very bad emails. <laughs> and uh, it's not necessarily in the terms of addresses. You know, when you acquire addresses or you're doing billing or anything else, I mean, there's one physical address that's out there. And there are things out there that actually encourage to try and find and make sure that if somebody's moved and, and done that, that they are, you know, that you have the correct address. Well, in terms of email, we usually see multiple email addresses coming from the actual same person. And so, for instance, when we start with an organization, we'll say, you know, how many emails are actually assigned to the same person? Because sometimes we get work versus we get personal and all these other things. And then in addition to that, what we often find, too, is that depending on the type of email that you acquire and the method in which that you acquire it, the email, the person receiving that might view you as more spam if you're continuing to email certain things and, and at the same time, them cha being challenged with the kind of content that you're selecting. And so really the churn just happens naturally from that. Uh, in addition, they might have been, they might have gotten on your list, um, uh, not necessarily in the way that they wanted to. So let's look at a few key numbers when we're talking about email, because as we look at these numbers, what's really interesting, and this comes from the N10 uh, e benchmarks, is that we use this as our benchmarks here when we look at campaigns, is that, you know, now the email fundraising open rate is around 13% overall. So if you send an email solicitation and it's open by 13% of your email list, you're doing pretty good. And I know that um, for some of you, you might have higher when it comes to actual email newsletters. You know, sometimes those rates will be in the 18 to 20% range. 
But in general, what we see um, with our clients too as well is roughly around that 13%. Now, depending on the kind of email list that you have, if it's somewhat brand new, you you might get a little higher. You know, it's interesting. We work with an organization I'm going to spotlight later on here, and they really just started the fundraising process. They asked a donor to help and uh, bring us in to help them think through how they're doing things. And, and one of the key things that we heard uh, or that we discovered is that early on when you're gathering a lot of emails from people, especially when you're really early in a small organization, a lot of the emails that you gather are those that are really sort of one of the closest early adopters to what, you know, I'll call your programs or anything else in which that they're really entrenched in what you're doing and and they're because of personal relationships they're really involved well we uh we sent a solicitation out and uh to a to a, an email database that had 500 emails on it to do a solicitation and the response rates were uh, the open rates were roughly around 40% wow it would look fantastic right maybe i could uh, go win an award for that but um in reality it you know i had to put the caveat out there that these are early adopters and this isn't, they didn't necessarily have a long history of, of going through emails. And so therefore, you know, it was, it was sort of, um, not unrealistic to get those kinds of numbers. Now, if the organization had been in his, you know, in, in, uh, in, in existence for a little bit longer, they've gone through and done a lot of email acquisition campaigns. They've done certain things. That number would probably be a, be a lot less. So 13% open rates on your email fundraising. 0.42 actually click through to that donate button and all those other buttons that you actually have in there and really only 0.07 actually respond to fundraising appeals. So let's make sure we understand this. Only 0.07 really respond to fundraising appeals. And what's really challenging with that is that we have really seen, as you'll see there, a drop in a lot of those rates. And now when we do some of ours, we'll we'll always shoot for that we want at least... um, uh, you know, a little bit better of a response rate overall. Um, so we'll try and go for at least a 0.1, you know, 0.1% response rate. That's always our goal. And um, in, which is really, you know, can be tough at times, depending on what time of year it is, because we notice, and uh, I believe the, I believe others notice this too, is that during the month of December, response rates can get even lower than that. Open rates are even much more lower than that only because of the volume that's actually going out uh, in general. And so, again, we have to be realistic as what email can really do. Again, when you hear some really great email stories, what we're finding is that those organizations have, you know, hundreds of thousands of emails in their system. But it doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, that they uh, are all as um, fully involved as a constituent. And that's really where your organization can excel um, from that standpoint. The other thing that we have to understand with email is that it's not going to replace, per se, the direct mail uh, at all. Now, there's some interesting data that's been coming out of some of the transaction companies like BlackBot and others recently that talks about that right now when a person actually starts in an online or or responds to an email fundraising appeal, that that their second actual gift is really coming from direct mail. And in fact, their longevity, so the, you know, the, the lifetime of that donor staying with the organization in the email channel or online when they start there actually is not as high as those that actually move to a direct mail. So I know that that challenges some of us because I know you might be wanting to move away from direct mail. But what we have found, and we've done this as well with our clients, is that after somebody donates online and or they respond to an email, a next ascend that actually gives them the the direct mail will see a good response rate back in the direct mail. Now, some of you might be wondering, how is that the case, right? We always thought that people actually stay within the way that they actually give. It, it doesn't happen. And there is one little thing that sort of uh, gets at the direct mailers to a certain extent, too, in the fact that after a person donates online, they start the brand awareness. And that might be the way in which that they've been first interacting with the organization. Upon completing that, they then move into when they see a direct mail land at home, they're actually responding to that too. And so it becomes more of a brand association at that point. We moved beyond brand awareness. And so it's really just a transactional piece. It doesn't necessarily mean they retain the direct mail, but they're responding to it. And what that all means is that 
we have to work in tandem together. Email, direct mail, social media, all of our multi-channel fundraising only because we don't see donors staying within the same channel overall. They move, uh, they move back and forth at times, but primarily do move into an offline mode uh, as well. The other thing that I need to mention before we get going here is that it takes a lot of patience and a lot of learning uh, when you're doing email. It really is a complete testing environment. I mean, you, you're doing email, and the best thing about email that we don't have in direct mail is the fact that we can know who opens it. We can see or you know find the responses to those that actually click on donation buttons. So we know what's going on uh, overall. I always find it funny that uh, well, I always love looking at the stats and you know the the person that clicks on the, the donate button the most that doesn't donate is usually the staff person. Um, so that might be you, but at least we know in reality what's occurring. So emails effective in an instantaneous response rates, which is just fantastic. With direct mail, we can obviously find and test certain things. The responses are much slower. I mean, we're waiting two to three weeks out. And so shifting messaging or, or even having the expense or, or the budget to, to resend something is really a challenge for some. So email then becomes a low cost testing environment that can be used. And it also becomes, I would say, one of the biggest games that you have to look at. It's almost like gamification, right? Some of the best clients that we've worked with in this standpoint have digital website managers or marketing people or even a development person that has really turned their email fundraising into a game. It's like, you know, if I tweak this image, if I shift the language this way, if we go with a different look and theme, you know, and you get to test things out much faster and really do it. And and over time, you begin to see how your donor database reacts to things. I think uh, the hardest thing in the realization for a lot of groups is to say, okay, we're going to send an email, and if we don't get a big response, we're going to you know, move back to direct mail and so on. When in fact, it's just going to take time to learn. Uh, and it really, you know, as for us even working with somebody, it takes us time to get there too as well. So let's go ahead and talk about some case studies up here. And I actually we shared one. I wanted to share this one with you immediately because it just happened, which is great. It's actually uh, um, one of the groups that we work with. The, um, uh, the, the piece that we have here is around uh, the Immigrant Welcome Center. Now, this was a solicitation done by email. And there's several key things that you have to understand in this piece. Is, is that this one is actually, after, it was the second email in a series. The first email had the same branding that you can see, and I'll kind of wait, put my cursor over that. It had some of this um, sun rays kind of piece, because what we were trying to do is is talk about how um, how the Immigrant Welcome Center has helps those get jobs and do all of these wonderful things in the community. And the first email did okay. It, it, it um, got some of the early adopters. It definitely got some of those that you know, had not um, participated uh, in the past, but it really, it was more about awareness of the campaign in general. And what you'll notice here overall is actually a, a couple key things that we decided to do in the second email. And this is going to be a common theme that you'll see throughout, is that we decided to put in this second email, the one that we needed to be more compelling overall, a use of a match from their from big donors. This is actually a former mayor, and he's very well known. And so we asked him to give a, a very casual picture of him and his wife. And in addition to that, what we decided to do too is that we wanted to save the match for a little bit later in importance. Now, know that in the first email, we actually sent out and said in there, we do have a match available from the Petersons, and uh, it's available if you, you know, take advantage of it, and, you, and it's a one-for-one one match uh, overall. But what we did is that was actually only two or three lines towards the bottom, just like right around here um, in the area where you'll see my cursor too as well. What we spent um, more, what we wanted to make sure happened in that first email is to announce the campaign, get everybody prepped. In addition to that, between the time of the campaign, and also between the time of the campaign uh, email launch, we also landed the direct mail. So in case they didn't respond through that. And then what we decided that we would do is actually use that match that even though they just heard about it as the center and focal point next. 
And what we decided to do in this second email is actually have it come from the, the you know, former mayor himself, the donor himself. The subject line came from them. And it was a very simple, or the sender, and it was a very simple subject line, join us. Well, if you know if you're getting an email from them, it's a really, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those like local celeb, local kind of uh, uh, leader as well. So we knew that we probably would get some good open rates just by them being the sender, but then just just a small piece that talked about join us. Uh, we raised about 2300 which was really great. Um, we had about 15 new donors out of about 23. Uh, in addition, they had a very high open rate, probably the highest open rate that they've ever seen in a solicitation. We were roughly around 16%, 16 to 16, and it was like 16 and a half, but I'll round down for some of you, um, 16 and a half. And I'll say one of the key things is you look at the copy there is that um, the goal was, is that we really wanted them to focus on that this was a match and also that we had a deadline. We really needed them to do this before their July 4th uh, piece and saying that they're going to personally match this uh, if you do that. So again, we, we felt that we could use the leverage. It's not like we didn't, you know, we started to use that early on in some of the emails, but we really saved it for the end because we wanted to feel as if we could get there. Um, the last email that did go out on July 4th, uh, by the way, we did send an email solicitation on the 4th. In that email solicitation, we had a bar graph on how much we still needed to raise. And we obviously were very close to it. We were off by maybe uh, $500. And so we, they definitely met the goal from there. Um, and in the second sequence, this email that you'll see, that you see on your, uh, on your desktop here on, on the screen, this email had higher open rates, it had higher click through rates. And, uh, in the donate button overall, we had the highest actual response rates than all the other emails. The first email only generated about 10 donations. The second email, as I mentioned, a little over 20. And then the last email, um, generated only roughly around 10. So uh, we did get direct mail in. And you should know, and I should be clear, that an email in this situation uh, generated some nice money, but it didn't, by far, the direct mail campaign did much, much better. So what worked? One is we actually used, we, we used the name in the subject line, or in the sender line. We used a very small piece in the subject line and affiliated with that with that person. So, you know, if you get a message like that that says, join us, um, that's probably going to happen from there. We didn't... Uh, and we knew that we wanted to try and do the first thing is actually have their image be the first thing that pops up on the screen in, in a casual image, not necessarily a formal piece, because then it wouldn't look as personal and email t needs to be looking personal. And then lastly, what really worked, too, is, is that we saved and really highlighted the fact that they would personally, you'll notice that personal language that's used uh, throughout here, too, as well. So that's really what worked um, from this standpoint. This is another one that just went out. That's that's why I wanted to share this one, too. And then I'll talk about one that we did earlier here in the spring in Huntsville, Alabama. In this one, it was an, it was a, an environmental group. And um, the reason why I really wanted to try, talk about this email here is, is that it's, it's using video um, in the email. Now, I want to make sure that we understand the challenges uh, that email can have in, in – um, the challenges that video can have in email. First and foremost – it's not that we don't like video. We love video. But the thing is, is that you can embed a video um, in a really good filter place through an email. That's going to that's gonna be a very positive experience. And so typically, the video brings you back to, say, a YouTube channel or brings you back to a donation page for the, for the organization, like on their organization website. The challenge there is when you do that, when you're bringing them back, you know, at that time, we've already sort of went from email to, to website. We still haven't converted them yet. And so they haven't been necessarily, um, they haven't heard the case for support, the reason why money is needed right now. And so coming back to the email to read the rest can sometimes be very challenging. So going back and forth uh, between channels. Now, the thing that video can do, which is very exciting, is actually, you know, that's an opportunity for you to display and and talk very succinctly about in a very humanistic way. 
my only thing with videos sometimes that we like to do is actually say video for more higher level givers, uh, mid to higher level, who will probably spend the time to watch it. We um, we tend not to, and this is just our own preference, we haven't seen as, mu- as much success using video solicitations on a brand new audience that has never given, only because the likelihood of them clicking over, spending a minute, 30 seconds, whatever that timeline time is of that video to watch the video, then come back and actually give, has been much lower than it has been when we've sent it to repeat donors, when we send it to major or mid-level donors too as well. And so in this piece that we see here is that we actually sent this to mid-level donors and above. Um, there was a varied, play, there was a varied and altered uh, email that went out uh, in addition to this to the larger base. But in a lot of these uh, that you'll see here, um, this was meant to be a personal message from the CEO, his name's Jesse. And that's what we wanted to be the first thing that was right underneath the banner is to actually have him on there. We did a modified letter version, as you can see throughout. And we wanted the highlighted of the big three things that, that we needed help, they needed help with, or, or I'm sorry, that they were going to actually use the money with. And so that included meeting legislators, you know, the con- building coalitions and the communities and so forth. And so what we did is that we actually, you know, decided that instead of just writing in the text what the money would do is that we just pulled them out, made a simple graphic overall. Now, sometimes you're probably wondering whether or not we did that, whether or not we'll actually do a very big designed email. Um, Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't uh, only because not, um, not every email that we go through can always have the, the images be displayed. And so anytime that we've done a full email image, um, we have seen either a little bit lower and or the same equal amount to a text. So that's been only our preference. I can't, or our experience, I can't speak to any others, but that's been uh, what we've been seeing. So what we wanted to do too, this is a a theme around um, values around the environment, is that those that were very big environmentalists could could see themselves within those values uh, too as well. Again, we downplayed the match. You may notice there right above the donation button that there is a match, a family foundation actually matched the money. Now that, uh, and then later on, as you can probably tell with the previous one, we went um, we went much higher uh, in promotion of that match as we got closer to it. Had a lot of mid-level gifts, mid-level gifting being 50 to about $100 uh, in range, um, where we would consider lower level giving anything but below that. In addition to what worked is in the mid-level gifting, we saw a lot, again, speaking to that video, head over, watch the video. And then of course we embedded a link on that at the end of that video to go donate. And so that, that occurred from there uh, too as well. We also made the page that they were going to on the website mobile friendly. And on there too, in the mobile friendly page, uh, they were actually um, brought in there to donate, which is another key piece we have to mention here is, is that all of the links that you're trying to send somebody to to actually go donate should be on what we what would be called mobile friendly transaction pages on your website because if you because it's going to be very difficult for somebody to try and do some of that without actually being um, without actually having the ability to easily donate in that moment when they're inspired which is definitely what email does so a big check mark is when you send somebody over and test this out send an email to yourself um, and what, and try and see if when you click on the donate button, what it looks like on there. Because we try to modify all of those pages to make it look friendly. Now, if you're on any simple website, like a WordPress or anything else, almost all of them have moved to mobile looking friendly pages. And so just make sure that it looks, uh, that way too as well. The thing that we really wanted to test here too is that we wanted to, um, we wanted to see if anybody would actually click on the certain issue topics that you'll see there. So when, when I ask what could be worth testing, those were actually buttons too. So we wanted to see if any of the donors would actually identify with a particular thing that they wanted their money to go to. Uh, some did, but not all. So, uh, you know, a real learning lesson for us is that we, we sometimes will do it in graphics, but we'll, again, still get some of the great response when we would highlight that in text as a hyperlink over. 
Now, the links that they were brought to were areas of a dashboard that showed where they're, where they're at with progress with these three core areas. And so somebody could actually take a look, see how they're doing, and then make their decisions from there. So what worked? Um, it, what works is that it was a personal direct ask from the CEO. He was personally involved in it, really focused on the mid-level and higher. Um, and what also worked, too, is that we started to try and connect them directly in the content there to what that individual might want or see. So the next one here is actually uh, um, a, a group that works at Huntsville Hospital Foundation in Huntsville, Alabama. It's a group that we also work with. And um, this was a solicitation that was done by several of the affinity groups affiliated with the actual hospital foundation. And in this one, what they were doing um, from this standpoint was actually trying to help um, individuals who, um, who were part of their development council and a new professional association called Ignite that was affiliated with the hospital to um, actually give to an end of year campaign. The Development Council, now you're probably wondering, wow, 10,000 seems like a very big number. Well, um, 10,000 uh, is probably a little bit larger than we would normally do on a goal for this size organization. But the Development Council representatives were those that actually were sort of junior board or you know, going to be on the board. And so they had the capacity to give at higher levels uh, overall. What you'll notice here uh, that we decided to do is, is that we um, both, what, what ended up happening is that both of these small affinity groups affiliated with the hospital came together to try and raise that money. Uh, in this particular solicitation from the Development Council, we, um, we raised about $2,100 and we received about three or four um, really large gifts, larger than we would normally, you know, in the $300 ranges. What was really great probably about this one and what really worked is that we used the leaders from each group to email them. And then this was actually something of a tactic that we used. The group was not, uh, was not that large. And so instead of actually having it come from, say, the MailChimp or your exact target or whatever, um, whatever kind of uh, a mobile um, website or email provider you use, we decided to actually have each one of those. We asked, um, as you'll see there, Amanda and Natalie to do us a favor. We asked if they would take this that it looks like in an email and forward it on. So we sent them a test copy that was the actual copy, asked them then to forward it on, and we gave them two or three messages that, that it looks like it's a personal forward. And it really was because they did that. <laughs> And because I think each one of them maybe had 40 or so, so we asked them to individually forward on this. And so we gave them two or three sentences that they had. And then above those, we asked them to personalize it. So Natalie would say maybe, hey, Kim, I hope you're well. So glad that you've been a part of Ignite. Um, you'll you'll see below an email and, and, a pro and uh, we're trying to raise money before the end of the year. I hope you'll really consider this. There's more information below. So it really felt as if it was a personal uh, from Natalie herself. And so that was, that actually worked really great. Now, I'll say that it didn't mean necessarily that we got a lot of responses in the email itself. What it did actually do is give us a little bit more responses when the direct mail happened. And uh, some of those responses were checks and credit cards that just pro you know were more transactional from that standpoint. The other thing that I would say that was a unique piece in this is that we did switch around the language based upon which group was going to send it out at times. Uh, and so those that we knew would be a little bit more in development council is, you know, you can see we switched around the names uh, at certain times uh, throughout the copy. Now, we, we wanted to also highlight that um, it was going towards one thing, a defibrillator, and that they could sort of own that. Um, we'll help train the hospital uh, and do that. So... But again, we had the association of the individual leader personally forwarding on. Can you help was a really great one because it felt like a personal message. And it also works and could, and what also works in that standpoint is the, is the, the sort of using the lower email as sort of the design and letting that actually be a click through to the donation page. This is another one that uh, we worked on too. And in this one, this was actually part of a series uh, where we combined a solicitation in an email with doing other actions. So um, in this one, this was actually a fraternal organization we had worked with. 
And uh, in, in what we try to do here is actually talk about, you know, this, it was a primary month that they were gearing up for, um, for their big leadership program, their national leadership training. And what they wanted to do is, or what we, what we had worked with them on is they had a, they had a program called My LCA, which is actually a, um, a website where the people, where the alumni members could log in. Uh, the really most important thing that we wanted them to do was give us their information in that, or at least that's what the organization wanted. The other thing is, is that you'll see there on the bottom right, the sharing, you know, share with 10 other people on Facebook and you could receive. So we incentivized a little bit on the sharing aspect as additional actions for them to do. And then, of course, on the giving. The This email actually was sent out by the fraternal leader, the executive, and it was sent out to the the um, a younger demographic overall, in which that they wanted them to participate in other ways, updating their contact information because they were coming right out of college, and then in addition to that, uh, focus on some some other sharing aspects. What uh, what was what was really interesting is that actually the campaign was designed for two parts. One is not only to, to try and get resources, obviously, but also to get them to do something because some of them have not actually participated in whether it be a solicitation or anything else. And so when somebody would share something and we knew that because we could click through and see it, we would, the second email they got would say, thanks so much for sharing. What we now want you to do is see if you can do all, you know, do the other two of the give 10, which is give or update. And so the three sequences, we just took it from there. And so when they did one, then the next one would be do another action, which was one of the other three. And so this first email is used as a cue to see how we would send the rest out. So it only raised $500. Well, you have to imagine that that was 50 donors, you know, $10, you know, 10, it was, can you spare 10? And that was uh, the $10 campaign. So um, that's why the dollar amount was much lower. And in fact, when they went to the transaction page, the it, it limited it to ten dollars. We wanted them not to feel as if they uh, needed to give more. So what really worked is that we used it. We used it as a lead-in to do other actions. I think what could really be worth testing that we didn't do in this piece is is some of the other language throughout to see which ones that would work uh, too as well, like their leadership programs and see. Um, again, the clicks through helped us really understand which one that they were drawn to to do first. Uh, the incentive did work. I won't lie. Uh, it did provide some things because it must, I think it cost a little bit to go to the leadership seminar and as a college student. And so doing that was, you know, uh, an opportunity for them to win. And I think that was a really great piece. And so the, obviously we did have less that did the give 10. Now, I will say, too, that they went on site. Um, this was one of the final emails when they did the Give 10, as you can see there. Um, that one of the things they also did is that this had, was also an on-site campaign. We continued it at the leadership, at their seminar. And so what was really great about that is that at the seminar, we could, they had already had brand awareness of the campaign, which is another tactic you can sometimes use when you're leading up to a special event, you can send sometimes some pre-email solicitations. And so that when you ask for that at the event, um, that there's some brand affiliation at that point. Um, this one had only one action. It was not personal at all. I mean, it was meant to, it was meant to do one thing. It was the giving part now at this stage uh, of what was going on. All right. And so the last one that I'll talk about before we get to some key things is this is a, a festival that we work with. And in this festival, what they are trying to do is actually raise money for um, for directors and producers. Um, it raised roughly around 1200 But I think the key thing here, again, was the personalization. We had the, the gentleman of um, he was just at an, on a podium talking about what he was able to do with all the resources and the money from his high school film competition. It made it much more personal. And then we had a video of the short we included in the email sort of a promo in a way for them to go and watch a short uh, of which is a, a short means, you know, obviously a short film of uh, Miguel. And we saw a lot of people very intrigued and they, we had not sort of passed that out uh, at all. So it was a great opportunity to feel as if the email recipient was getting something in addition to trying and donate. And by the way, at the end of the short, which was really great, we were able to ask for money and say, this is what, you know, through the power of giving, this is exactly what we were able to do is to help Miguel create this from the resources. 
Now, this had a theme called One Film Can. And so the theme was all about how it can inspire audiences and do certain things uh, overall. All right. And uh, as you see here, um, this was actually a, a cancer organization that we had here. And uh, in the cancer organization, the subject line, it came from the CEO. I want to caution against always using the CEO as the sender. We really only use that once or twice a year when it comes to solicitations, if you're doing more than one. Um, we really caution against because sometimes you lose the social capital. And we don't want them to always feel as if the CEO is asking for money. Um, what really worked, too, is on the right-hand side, we, we, had, um, we, we really saw a lot of people clicking on free services, and we used the concept of free, that you know, we're providing these things free. It's a big difference, and we really need that to happen. Uh, too as well to make this even more free as we go forward. The CEO is very well known, and so when he when we leverage him, because again we want to be careful because he sends out a lot of other advocacy notes and everything else, is that when we do leverage him, we do see a higher response than coming from the organization. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about what you can do. Um, a couple things that I highly recommend: how to prepare for an email solicitation. First and foremost is actually write the content out before you even put in graphics. And then this is actually what you'll see here. Uh, do you remember that? Do you remember the uh, email before where we had the environmental organization? Well, we decided to do, and this is a separate email that we we're working on, but we'll write the copy first. We'll try to get it down. And what we really want to start out with is no imagery so we can get all the copy down of everything that we think we want to do. And then we end up cutting the copy um, by another third, <laughs> probably, but only because it's based on space, based on images when they come back in uh, as well. The best thing that I have found is you map this out. It's really draw it out. We call this a wireframe, just like in a website. We'll wireframe the emails out to see how we might want, where we might want an image, where we might want to have certain things, how we want the text to appear uh, to as well. I know that it might be a little bit of an exercise, but I highly recommend it. It really helps you succinctly say, this is where you should give your money to, this is how you should do it, and so forth. The other thing that I would recommend, too, is that find the images after you decide what copy is going to actually be in there. We sometimes are always led by the images first, and we're saying, oh my gosh, we got this really great image, it's of one of our students being helped, and then we start to write copy around it. But it's really tough because you don't necessarily have the story. So the best thing we do is always look at how we can create the copy first and then insert the images. Now, there will be other people that will say they like to do it the other way around, and that's fine. We'll j I just caution you because sometimes you end up trying to write something from an image that just is a really great image, just doesn't have anything around it. And it begins to look a little bit disjointed when you actually try and send it out a little bit. And what I like to do, too, is find words to use that really illustrate action. So, you you know, you'll always, um, we always try to do that as much as possible. Change and demonstrate, making it possible. Um, you know, you, we need you. Donor-centric language all of the time. But we try to illustrate action. And sometimes, you know, when we, you'll notice in some of our emails that you saw earlier, is that things like check out or do this is, is not only hyperlinked, but it stands out at times during something uh, during something else. So I definitely um, would recommend highlighting certain phrases that inspire action, that inspire units, you know, that one or two sentences, that if they read nothing else, if they just read that sentence, they're inspired and illustrated to actually act. So here's a couple checklist things to think about, um, and we'll go to uh, uh, for the next five to eight minutes, so feel free to then put in your questions, and we'll get those to the end of the hour. First thing to do before you start writing, what stories of the program and donors could you actually use? Um, you know, one of the key things that we always recommend that you might have heard us say is that you know, every week as a team, and whether that's you and one other person, <laughs> you and a group of volunteers, whoever that team is, decide that week, what is the story we really want to capture? Who are the people we're going to help this week? I mean, go through who's going to go in the clinic this week or who's going to be mentored and see if we can pull out something there. See if there's something there that could be used not only for a solicitation in the future, but also maybe even in social media. You know, what I always say is that how can we create specific gifting options at different levels and so that we always know that if we are going to send out a solicitation to say major or, or mid-level gifts, that we at least have something that says, you know, $50 can do this. And or 
that if we're to do a campaign at some point that requires lower level, like $10 or $15, this is what that would really do. I always find it fun, and maybe you don't, I don't know, but to actually start to brainstorm themes that tie stories together. And, you know, when you're talking at the beginning of the week and you're actually going through, like, who are the people we're helping? Do they kind of have some of the same common things? Well, maybe that's part of the story, you know, as in that that other one I just talked about. We saw a lot of seniors during that time needing free services to get to cancer prevention treatments. And that was like, that is just, it is happening. It's happening in real time. Let's tell people, let's use that. We have got great stories because it's so relevant. We're hearing it right now. Let's try and make that happen together. So I, that's something that I always look at is that your best stories, an email, because it's impulsive, actually come from the impulsive moments of your program side. Like, what are you, what are your program people dealing with right now? What are the beneficiaries that you're trying to help with in this moment dealing with right now? Is it the fact that some of them didn't get to go enjoy the 4th of July fireworks because, you know, they just couldn't get there or, you know, whatever that is. So use relevant moments because email is so impulsive to try and connect that into the solicitation. A couple things to also consider when it comes to segmentation. Remember, become your biggest mad scientist, right? So you're going to have to look at how you can create, you know, different variations of emails to try and really test things. Now, something to remember, just because you change the order of words or maybe just one or two sentences, you may not see enough of an actual reaction. We like to test things where we're completely shifting the layout, where, you know, we're going with a full page Im- or a full image, or we're going to actually insert an image here where we're going to use it with text. And so we're really testing things out overall. I highly recommend that every campaign, you set aside 100 people who have never donated to you before, that you have their emails for. And that's the one that you really test some, <laughs> some big crazy stuff on. Um, it's our crazy test pool. And some of you are like, well, why would we do that? We want to send them everything. Well, you've already probably sent them newsletters, other solicitations. At this point, honestly, if you really want to get a test group out there that's already listened and heard all your messages, that's what you want to do. So find 100 people within your email database. Go back through with like if you're using like a Miami or all of those and see who has never who has never actually given. And let's focus on them uh, first. This is, if it's your first time asking for donations via email, um, you know, or you don't have a history of giving responses from email appeals, you'll want to ensure that, that, that you ease people into it. If the first email that you're sending actually is a solicitation ever, you need to, you need to kind of step back and, and not think it that way. We would recommend that you at least spend a good six months to eight months getting people used to getting your email information, getting newsletters, updates, And one of the key things that we'll have when we work with an organization who's in that case is that we'll ask the executive director to send out their first email and say, hi, this is us. This, you know, you're going to be hearing from us from this medium. And these are the things that you're going to hear about. Uh, From time to time, we will ask for money because there are things that come up immediately that we want to alert you about to try and help us. You know, those, that's some language that you can definitely use. And then how you're going to personalize it. You know, you need to try and use not only donor-centric language where it says you and try and use, you know, Derek, thanks so much. And insert Derek, you know, my name into certain aspects of the copy. All of the email systems now allow you to do that kind of mail merge. And so that's a st- it's pretty much a standard function at this state. But it's okay throughout the copy to be like, you know, Derek, this is exactly the time we need you. We need you to act and we need you to act before July 4th in order to help us and take advantage of that match. Use my name to make it as personal as you can. Now, we have used names, personal names, of the recipient in subject lines. So it could be the subject line, Derek, we need you to step up now. Um, in that standpoint, that that could be something where, um, and we have seen some good response rates to that, by the way, because it shows as if it's coming on a more personal note. We never would send that, though, from the organization. So it wouldn't be like, um, nonprofit.org or whatever the email address is, sending it to Derek because it's a disconnect. You always want to try and send the personal subject line from the personal subjects, you know, from the personal sender. So in this case, maybe your CEO would then have that in there because it seems as if it's a little bit more personal than where it is. And, you know, when you think about that personalization overall, 
is that it's okay to actually ask a lot of your volunteers, your other donors, to be the senders for you. And, and it's good for them to actually go about and say, so in this email, you know, this is actually what we're trying to do. And I'm sending this because I'm so passionate. I care so much. And it's now is the moment that we really need your help. On the design side, what imagery is available that you can tie into the campaign theme? You know, it's from an existing standpoint, uh, too, as well. The best things that we have used sometimes, this is going to sound crazy, where we've, you know, in those weekly meetings when it's you and your volunteers or somebody else is going to be with the, with the program people, the beneficiaries, iPhone images. You know, if we don't have an image that we think we really want to use or the story we want to capture, just we'll go out and ask somebody to just try and get it even on an iPhone. It's that phone right there. We, there's so much things that you can do with it from that standpoint. And in email, the nice thing about email is that you can, you know, make it look a little bit nicer. There's other filters and things, even on Instagram that we've used that came from there that had no professional photographer involved uh, at all. If, you know, if you have a graphic designer, they can probably handle a lot of the branded components. If you do want to feature a video, remember, remember what you might want to think about when it comes to that mid to higher levels. And what content specifically? What are the things we want to link to? Are there certain things in the text that we want to really pull out and make sure that they read? And that's maybe where you put a box around it or something else. We tend to be drawn to things like that, um, bigger text uh, in that standpoint as, as people skim. And a substantial amount are actually reading email content on their mobile phones. That's a core piece that we'll really, really recommend from there. Let the next couple design questions, you know, is it visually appearing, but clear enough to lead the donors to the most important elements? We have done complete text, uh, complete text ones, but we've only done that after we sort of use the other designed elements to introduce the campaigns. Um, and then, you know, how does it look on mobile? You really do need to check it. I mean, 83% of those under the age of 35 are viewing email solicitations, newsletters, and so forth. And it comes down to about 20% in other generations. So a substantial amount are viewing content in smartphones and mobile devices. You better be ready to help and try and lead them. And then not only are the links working, but they're actually bringing them to a mobile-friendly mobile uh, environment to try and get them there. Then last thing that I would say, too, is on the content. Is it concise but still contain all the elements of a good solicitation? Um, you know, sometimes we're so afraid to write too much. And I get that. Um, now, we're, we are saying, though, that the people that are receiving the email have opted in to a certain extent to receiving your communications. And when it's a good solicitation, it's okay to be, it's okay to have some length to it. Um, you know, not in a lot of length, but at least, you know, to, we always recommend below 300 words. Um, and from that standpoint, it's very donor centric, uses a lot of that you, 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 and not us. We need you to help fight against water. We need you to help fight against childhood abuse. Notice that I didn't say, we need you to give to us because we're going to work and try and make this happen sometimes. We'll use that language when it's very impulsive, you know, where, when the organization needs certain things in that moment, impulsive. But we try to stay away from some of that language um, early on where we'll talk about causes and we'll talk more about the issue at hand. Try and create the emotional connection through the story, the donor's personal story, the image. You know, like I showed you, we had that image right above there of the former mayor, very casual. You know, it's like, oh, you know, that I know them, you know, and, and it felt uh, a little bit more personal. And of course, branding throughout that makes them feel as if this is coming directly to them. We do like some gifting options that can show impact from time to time, uh, in, especially on donation pages. You know, sometimes I'll get the question, Derek, should we give a specific amount? Um, we do give specific amounts when we're trying to, when a branded campaign has an amount incorporated into it. From other times, we do just go into more generalistic and donate. We really want them to donate. Now, um, if it's for a club or if it's for something else, we'll ask them to get to that higher level, of course. And then tracking success, lastly, before we get to some of your questions. Um, obviously, open rates, click-through rates, and response rates on each email and each email segment is really great. Um, what's really important, though, on the click-through rates, if you decide to test the, the whether or not the image works or whether or not the actual l sentence or line of something that you've changed, make sure that you make that very clickable and noticeable so that you can see if there's any rate differences um, with different segments. You know, 
I always say you've got great time, you know, never, never really create your, your other emails in your series of campaigns. We only really create one and then we'll create ones after that based upon the response. I mean, I'll tell you that we have in the past created some beautiful second and third emails that we've ditched <laughs> because, you know, the first email didn't get what we wanted and we needed and the test things that we were testing just didn't happen. Um, you know, we kind of chalked it up to a fail, fail fast. And we did, and we said, all right, we're going to move into doing something else. And so, and we, and it's a good process to go through with our clients too, as well as, you know, we, there are some things as we're trying to learn about their donor audiences and what they do that we got to be able to shift. And that's the best thing about email that you don't get with direct mail. And of course, refer to benchmarks in the sector, use that as a reference, but don't always use it as your only reference. You, you're going to start to get historical aspects from there. And what you'll also begin to know is that as you're going through your email solicitations, is, is that especially at the end of the year, when you're doing your development planning for next year, go through every email solicitation you sent and say, all right, what was the open rate on this? What were the key things that were different? What made something happen different? And so forth. And really put them all in one area, spreadsheet or something, that allows you to go back and really analyze whether or not certain solicitations did certain things so that as you look at the course of the next year, as you're doing your development planning, you can say, well, we're going to test these things because they haven't been done yet. We're going to work on this broader piece here. And then on the other pieces, we'll really, really focus on, on making sure that we get the kind of response rates that we want. So, and, and don't be afraid too, as you're sort of mapping it all out to fail in some of your emails. I mean, that, the best learning is when something doesn't work and you can shift it. Because an email, it's not besides your time, but learning from that is going to be really important because it can also influence your direct mail. All right, some final thoughts. Feel free to put some questions in and we'll go to the hour. I know that we like to always end a little early, so um, we'll try and do that if we can here. So learn from each solicitation, become your own mad scientist. Uh, you should, and this is a, a good thing is, that I recommend, is that um, I've got a good, I, when I was doing some of this, and we, we do this here with some of our clients, is we try to ask people who are non-staff or family friends in the organization to really review things for the first time. When What we see happen a lot in email is, is that an organization, when they're cutting the copy down, right, to get to that very short piece, they tend to cut out things that, most of us may not know. The general public would know about you. So for instance, you know, more background around you or what it is you're trying to do because you feel as if you've over communicated it in other mediums. And unfortunately, the mass general public or your email list is not going to retain that. And so it's always good to have somebody that doesn't know you that well and um, that they can kind of review some of your stuff for first time glance as if they've never heard of you, what it would be like. And then create an opportunity for social media to really share solicitations. As you develop some of that language, we'll, we'll tease them into some social media requests, maybe once or twice uh, over the course of three months, only because that sometimes when we try to get to emails, they're very impulsive from that standpoint. All right, so we're going to go ahead and take some of your questions. Feel free to put them into the GoTo panel here. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind you that we will make sure and give you the copy of this uh, presentation so that you can use that. In addition to, you can watch the video on the Achieve Access site as well. So one of the first questions that we're getting is around uh, email and board. Um, my board. My board is really excited about email campaigns to the point that they want to get rid of the direct mail. Uh, I was, I had heard too that direct mail still is in existence and still should be used. Glad to hear that. What would you recommend I tell the board? Um, so you should, uh, there's some really great studies. If you email me back later, um, I can get you the, this, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, the study that came out from Blackbond and others around multi-channel fundraising. And it has all of the stats in there talking about how those that actually give for the first time online an email and then move to direct mail because some boards like some stats there. So that's a really good piece that you probably would share. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, a lot of boards want to get rid of direct mail because of the cost. And you might not get a lot of, you know, might break even or anything else. What I would recommend is to actually do, and this is not about this topic, but try and get your direct mail cost underwritten so that, it, you know, anything you make, so any printing costs, all of that, have a donor say, give you four or $5,000 for the year to do your direct mail appeals. 
um, if you have a small donor base. Um, and that would at least free you up from doing both direct mail and email together. The next question is around using email for first time donors. We typically don't get we don't we typically don't get first time donors in our email campaigns. They tend to be the same donors or key volunteers that we have that volunteer with us throughout the year. Any suggestions to get first time donors? Um, well, it's a it's a tough one just off the bat. But again, I would look at if you're doing any crazy, you know, like videos or anything else. Again, that probably that hasn't had that huge success for first time um, with us. First time, I would probably do a lot more leveraging of what I was discussing earlier with like the Huntsville example, using some key people, forwarding the actual solicitation on, talk about the campaign and make it much more personal just to try and, try and get them to react uh, online. That would probably be uh, ideal for sure. The other thing that I would consider too is a lot of matches work. I mean, we, we have used, we try to do a lot of leverage campaigns and email because it's so impulsive and we can, we can say right then and there, if you give now your, you know, your dollars will double, you know, something else will, will happen to as well. So, you know, as I look at it from that perspective, try and leverage and try and use personal relationships forward on the emails uh, that you have. The next question comes around, what would be the perfect time to do campaigns, email campaigns? Uh, good question. We usually do campaigns in threes uh, in a year. We usually look at something like a spring campaign. We look at some campaign in the mid-year and then a third one towards the end of the year. Um, in the campaigns, we use those for different purposes. The first campaign is something that we'll, we usually cover that's more project, that's a little bit more, um, uh, project based, you know, cause we just came off of an end of year that was a little bit more about operating and, you know, needing to kind of meet the end of the year deadlines and tax and so forth. So we'll get really specific usually in the first, in the first part of the year only because the donor, um, is looking, you know, might be able to, might be more interested in that coming off of a direct mail or a regular general ask. We, we, we like the middle one to be more around awareness building that does fund the general operations. So for instance, if you're a cancer society, you know, breast cancer and awareness month, or, you know, there's a month for everything. Uh, and, or even if you choose like this week, we want you to do, we're trying to build awareness of this. So you can create your own awareness campaign that way and then actually use that as your email solicitations. Um, and then lastly, of course, the end of year, which is popular and needed to be done. I mean, you do need to send some email solicitations out the second and third days before the end of the year because those just generate for the whole sector a substantial amount uh, to as well. Another question here actually comes, and it'll be our last question, is around Giving Tuesday. Should we use our email to do Giving Tuesday? Well, I, you know, absolutely. You know, uh, email is an impulsive piece. There's a lot of great fanfare around Giving Tuesday. It doesn't hurt. That's a great opportunity to couple on to a lot of the other um, other national conversations. So I would highly recommend. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, our next session will be in a couple weeks. Uh, we'll make sure and get this to you if you need it in the video recording. Let us know if you have any questions, and we'll talk soon. Take care. Bye-bye.